Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin might be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Uh, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, guys. So, how are y'all today? Y'all are good? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, here and ready for the day. I got to do a little water here. Obnoxious dad of the day. Anybody on Facebook been following me, you know. I've been kind of the obnoxious dad putting the pictures on. Maybe it's not too obnoxious. I'm proud of my daughter. I'm proud of my daughter. I can't help that. You see, that's part of the story that we live in. It's part of the story of our life. That's part of who we are. Um, and we're here talking about story today. Um, truthfully, um, getting caught all up in that story of, of uh, my daughter getting all grown and everything. And um, it, it almost seems like it's not real. It almost seems like it's not real. I, I drive along, and I was telling folks in Sunday school this morning, I pulled up behind a, a van, you know, and I get all weepy-eyed because I see in the, in the van in front of me, there's one of those little DVD things that's folded down, and kids are watching it in the back of the van. And I'm thinking, my kids are growing up. Bye-bye, that's, that's not me anymore. But they're growing up. I'm caught in that story. But we're caught in this story today. Listen. He said to them, uh, these are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you. Well, any time a scripture begins with then, I always like to go back and see what happened prior to that scripture. Jesus is there with the disciples and speaking to them. And I found out going back and looking to see, as the children have told us, you know, Jesus had died and, and Jesus had uh, risen from the dead. And, and, you know, we're in this in these Sundays of Easter, we've been celebrating and talking about Jesus being resurrected, resurrected and brought back from the dead. And so I looked and saw that and found that the, the story of the road to Emmaus is there where Jesus is there and walking on the road with them. And they don't even recognize who Jesus is as, as he's walking with them and, uh, and, and known in the breaking of bread. And then they said, you know, our hearts kind of burned inside us because we knew, we should have known it was Jesus who was with us. But... Just prior to this text, Jesus appears to his disciples and he says, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood with them and said to them, peace be with you. And so Jesus showed up in the midst of them. Jesus had lived, Jesus had taught, Jesus had died, Jesus had been resurrected, and Jesus had come back in bodily form and showed up to them and said, peace be with you, I am here, and he comes to bring peace. You know what that the word peace really means? The, God's well-being for you. God's, it's the Hebrew word is shalom. Uh, but the idea is, is the same, whether it's Greek or in Hebrew. It is that I want the best for you. I want the best thing that God has for you. I got a crick in my neck this morning too, so I'll have to turn this way to look at you guys. I can't, and I have to turn this way if I'm going to look at y'all over there. So do forgive me on that one. That's part of my story too. You don't need to know about that. 
So he shows up to them and, and, and they were startled and they were terrified and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to make of it. They thought, well, this is Jesus. We saw him. He lived and he taught and he died. And now he's come back. And we see him and they were terrified. And the scripture said they thought that he was a ghost. They were afraid. And Jesus didn't want them to be afraid. He said, why are you frightened? Why do you doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. See, my, see touch me and see and know that it's, it's me. It's me. It's Jesus. I'm not a ghost. I'm, I'm here. Feel of me. You can tell that I'm here. He said, oh, do you have something to eat? And so they went and got some broil fish. And Jesus is almost like Jesus is trying to say, look, see, it's me. I got the broil fish. And he's eating the royal fish to show that he had really come back and he was in whatever resurrected body he had received was the one that was real and touchable and yet bore the scars of his crucifixion. And at the same time, he was able to eat to show that it was really, really him. You see, sometimes we wonder whether or not it is really a true story. That's, it is a difficult story to, to imagine that one who, we don't have any really experience of that. I'm not trying to say, you know, uh, if we have any doubt, that's a bad or a good thing necessarily. But the fact is that we do not have an experience of one who has been dead and now is alive. We don't have that kind of experience. Oh, you might say, oh, we've had somewhat of a kind of experience from time to time. You may say, Tony, well, maybe you had that experience one time. And I say, well, maybe I did. I, I had three dogs I received one time uh, when I was preaching in North Georgia years ago. I, was going, I went over to North Georgia to go to Emory University. And I, was, I moved over there and I was preaching in small membership churches where we made just enough to get by. Lynn and I call them our tuna days. Because Lynn had a, when we first got married, she just had a habit of every time she went grocery shopping, she would buy a can of tuna, put it on the shelf. She'd buy a can of tuna and put it on the shelf. Buy a can of tuna and put it on the shelf. After you married and gone to the, for a little while at least, you got a bunch of cans of tuna sitting around. And then if you're not making too much money and you're traveling a lot and you're going to seminary and Lynn's lost her job because she'd moved over there to follow me to go to seminary and we didn't have a whole lot of money, uh, we, we, what did we have to eat? We had tuna, so we had tuna. Now you think that might be great to have tuna, but for breakfast it's not so good. And it did get so bad one time that I, I can remember we, we didn't have any soft drinks. And I remember one time, and Lynn loved Pepsis, and, 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 and I saved up and I got a Pepsi, you know. And I showed up at the door coming in from seminary and showed up at the door knocking on the door. And I held up the Pepsi and I was the hero of the day. How did I get off there? How did I get way over there? I don't know. I don't know. Uh... Somebody remind me how I got to Georgia. Okay, y'all don't remember, so I guess it doesn't matter. Anyway, what's that? Emory. Emory. Oh, yeah, I was in Emory. Oh, yeah, that's why I went. I went to Georgia to go to Emory. And I was over there, and we had our tuna days. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't, but I don't, really don't, I lost why I was connecting that. So y'all excuse me for that. So uh, we, we were, uh, the, disciples are there and they're trying to say uh, the disciples are trying to say is this really Jesus and Jesus says yes this is this is really me it is really me I am here and I am with you and he shows them that and they eat and so from there they get to the text that we're in today when he said, these are my words. When I asked the question, these are my words, and this is in verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while, I'm still, while I was still with you. He was not talking about in this resurrection body that he is in now. He was talking about when I was with you before the resurrection. He was talking about when after he was born and when he was teach, living and teaching. And in that period of time, when I was with you, I told you these things. And everything about me was going, everything written about me and the laws of Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled, that there is going to be a fulfillment that comes uh, um, of these texts, these scripture texts. In other words, Luke is trying to tell us, in other words, Jesus is telling the disciples that 
His life is a fulfillment of what God has been doing. He's not some new upstart that's making up something that is not related to what God has always been doing. That God has always been at work, working out that Jesus Christ might come and, and be um, and fulfill the things that he was sent to do and fulfilled uh, to do the things that he was sent and fulfill. Uh, then he opened, their mind, he opened their minds to the understanding of the scripture and uh, said to them, incidentally, if God opens our minds, then we're able to hear. If God opens our hearts, then we're able to experience. It is in the opening of the mind. Well, why is it that we can't understand by hard work? Why is it that we can't understand any other way? It is because that is how God has made us and created us. It is because, it's because we really lack what it takes to understand the things of God unless it's revealed to us by God. And so Jesus opens up their minds. And he says to them, thus it is written, the Messiah is to suffer. The Messiah is to suffer. As the children were saying a minute ago, he was to die. But the, that the Messiah would suffer. Paul talked some about that suffering of Jesus and said a surprising thing to the Colossian church. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1.24. He says, I'm rejoicing now in my sufferings. For your sake, that is the church, I am rejoicing now in my sufferings for your sake and that in my flesh I am completing that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Did you hear that? You ever read that before? Because I tell you, it surprised me when I first read it because I thought to myself that, that Jesus, who they're talking about fulfilling all that there is to be fulfilled in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, and that everything written about him would be fulfilled and that he came and he suffered, and this is part of what he was teaching, he came and he suffered, that you would think that all of the suffering would be completed, but Paul says no. He says the very fact that you and I suffer as well, the very fact that those who suffer for, for the church, those who suffer for the kingdom of God, those who are suffering for God's people, for the sake of his body, are continuing and completing the suffering that was lacking, not completely full for what Christ has done for his body. The Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And here's where we get into the real story of what we, what calls maybe something for us to do. And that, his, the, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And in Acts it says uh, from Jerusalem to Judea and out to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the ends of all the earth. And I'm sending upon you what my father promised. Now go and wait. So in other words, he says, I'm sending you. Therefore you go and wait. And so that's where we are nowadays. This is, you know, actually Thursday, this past Thursday was 40 days out from Easter, Easter, the beginning of Easter season, the, the Easter day. Actually, so Thursday was 40 days out, which is traditionally the time that 40 days, 40 days, even though it's very compressed in Luke's gospel, this uh, ascension of Jesus Christ happened 40 days after he had risen from the dead. And so um, he has he has ascended. He has come and he is going to ascend. And listen to this text. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. Now Bethany is if you go to Jerusalem and you go to the Mount of Olives, just out. On, you, you go outside the walls of Jerusalem and go up the mountain, up the Mount of Olives. Uh, a lot of olive trees. Over on one side, there's a, a, a lot of tombs, sepulchers, whited sepulchers, tombs that Jesus talked about. And if you go over the hill, over the mountain of, Mount of Olives, you go to Bethany. So it says that they led them out 
that direction, led them over the hill of the Mount, Mount of Olives, and over on the Bethany side of the Mount of Olives, he led them and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. It's interesting that the Gospel of Luke begins in the temple and ends in the temple. I think maybe that's Luke trying to tell us something, that the worship of God in the temple is, is what it's about. So Jesus, on this 40th day, and now we're on the 43rd day, um, celebrating Christ's ascension. And I, I have to ask myself the question and ask us the question, what the ascension really means? What is it that, what are the fruits of the ascension? We know that the fruits of the resurrection are life and coming back to life, but what's the fruit of Jesus' ascension in the world? Well, because Jesus has been raised to the right hand of the Son of God, he has been made the Lord of the church, the head of the church, and the Lord of our lives. You know, we, we, uh, we, we say it like this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Y'all say it with me. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Stop right there. That's where we are today. That's where we are today. For it is Christ who has ascended to heaven, and he, because he has ascended to heaven, he has empowered the church. Jesus said, Jesus said, you will do more powerful things. You will do greater things than I do because I go to heaven, because I'm going back to be with God, because I am in resurrection. I'm going to, when he was foreshadowing the fact that of, of his ascension and going back to God. He said, you will do greater things than I because I'm going back to God. His presence in heaven um, at the right hand of the Father assures us that we have a place in heaven. We have a place in heaven. Jesus talked, he said, uh, you know, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. He said, when I, you know, I'm going to ascend to heaven, sit at the right hand of God the Father, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back and take you to where I am. So you might be where I am that there will be a place for you, that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father says that there is a place for you and a place for me in heaven. But that's possible. Not only because he did it first, but because he is there and is an advocate for us. That Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God means that he is the one who takes co-leadership with God of heaven and is given a name above all names that he is more further exalted than any other. Even before, even before the time of his incarnation, even before the time that Jesus came down to earth, he was not exalted like he is now because he had come to earth. And he lived, and he taught, and he healed, and he died, and he rose, and he ascended. Because he did these things, Paul, in writing to the Philippian church in chapter 2, says that he is given a name above all names, more exalted, more highly than, than any other name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is King and Lord. That he sits at the right hand of the Father means that Christ is the head of the church. 
Now, we sort of say that and take that for granted, that Christ is the head of the church. The church is a body with many parts, and a body with many parts that work together, and underneath the guidance of who? Of Jesus Christ. Let there be no mistake that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And he is Lord of all. He is Lord of everything that is all creation. He is given that by God. That's God's exaltation and glory of him because he's been lifted up. And he is our advocate with God. And he is interceding for us with the Father. In other words, this is part of God's plan from the very beginning that there should be that there should be Jesus Christ who is the Lord of all life, that he's Lord of our life and your life. Now, what do we do with all this? What do we do with these fruits of the ascension of Jesus Christ? We can just say, okay, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and he's up there and, and he's, he's, got our, he's got it all together. But unless it really affects me and you, Unless it draws us to do something, then it's just, it's all, it's all well and good, but it's, it needs to call us to something. Jesus' last words in Matthew's gospel are these, that, that we should go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them the things that I have taught you. In other words, what we call the Great Commission, and I'm going to walk, Lee, is that okay? Okay. I'm going to walk. The Great Commission. Uh, some have said, some biblical scholars say, that it might be better to not call it the Great Commission, but, but his, his last commission, his last words to, that he said to us that we were to carry on and to do. You know, Jesus gave us a number of things to do. He said, he said that we should uh, remember, and so we've got this table where we come together and we gather and we remember. And he said that we should baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we've got the baptismal font that reminds us and our baptisms that we do that remind us that we are doing what God has called us to do. But he has called us to make disciples. Now that's just not, that's not making disciples just for the sake of disciples. Why is that? Jesus Christ is, is the Lord in heaven and he is Lord of all what God, that God has given him. You know, there's beautiful prayers that Jesus prays for us when he prays and, 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 and is praying for all that God has given me. And what do we call it? We call it God's kingdom. Some folks call it God's realm or God's kingdom. This is that which belongs to God. So when we make disciples for Jesus Christ, when we ourselves become disciples of Jesus and make disciples and call people to follow Jesus Christ, then we are doing what God has left for us to do. Now in Luke's gospel, I'm talking about Matthew, but in, in, in Mark's gospel, he talks about it. In Matthew's gospel, he talks about it. In, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, in, in the beginning of Acts, he talks about it. That we should be witnesses. We should be the witness to what Christ has done. Witness to what God has done in Jesus Christ throughout the world. To take that to all the world. We should be witnesses. I don't guess I have to remind you that none of us would be here if someone had not told someone else about Jesus Christ. You know that, don't you? We wouldn't be here. This church wouldn't be here. Even with the long history that we have as a church, it wouldn't be here if, if long ago someone had not told someone else about Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you about this kingdom of God idea. It's not a new idea. I didn't make it up. It comes from the scripture. This idea of the kingdom of God and focusing our lives and giving witness, witnessing to what God has done in the world that we might build God's kingdom. It's not just, it's not, it's not simply for, excuse me, it's like the more water I drink, the more I need. I don't know why that is. It's like water. 
We are called to make disciples, but not just for the fact of making disciples. And we can say, disciple, disciple, disciple. We're a factory disciple. We're called to witness to the kingdom of God. Let me give you an example of that. They did a study fairly recently where they were, uh, they were studying this church that was very successful. And this church that was extremely successful and growing church and, and a, a really strong, viable, vital, growing congregation and church. And they started studying what they did. Said, what do you do? What do you do as far as evangelism? They said, one of our biggest things in evangelism that we do is this. We do a chat room evangelism. And the person that was doing the study said, a chat room, what? said, yeah, we go in the chat rooms online on the internet and we begin to talk to people about Jesus Christ. And we begin to let them know that uh, their life is not as really as miserable as they may think because God loves them and cares about them. And, 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 and we bring a ray of hope and we share something about, about God with the people in chat rooms and, 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 and then they come to know Jesus Christ and they come into the kingdom of God. And the person doing the study said, now wait a minute. You're growing, you're vital, you're a growing congregation, and yet one of your biggest evangelists, evangelism ministries is reaching out to someone who will probably never come and join and become a part of your church. And they said, that's right. He said, but somebody coming and joining and becoming a part of our church is not the point. He said, our people know very clearly that the point is bringing people into the kingdom of God. And he said, if we attend to that and bringing people into the kingdom of God, God, is, God takes care of the fact of who needs to come and make us successful in growing the church. He said, growing the church is not the point. Growing the kingdom, of it, growing the kingdom is, and as long as we focus on that, then God gives the increase and God grows us. Another study I'd like to say, I'd say something about is that they did a study of churches and people outside the church. That it, they asked people in churches and they said, what is it that folks outside the church want, need, to, need? What is it that they need? What is it they want and what is it they need? And this very same study asked people who are outside the church and said, ask them, what is it that you need? And what is it that the church could, could offer you and can, could give? People inside the church said, the people outside the church need to learn about doctrine and need to learn about the Bible and need to learn about, need to learn about all the ins and outs of faith and need to learn about this and that and the other. The people they asked who were outside the church said, We, need, we just need to know how our life can be better. We just need to know how our life can be better. Well, I'll tell you, as a follower of Jesus Christ and as a Christian, if you want to call it either way, I guarantee you I know that what God has done in Jesus Christ makes my life better. I bet he makes your life better. I know that I'm not any better. I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying to grow and, and, and do as God would have me to do. But I'm not a better person. I'm not better than anybody here or anybody out there in the world. I'm not a better person necessarily. But my life is better because I follow Jesus Christ. You can find some of the lowest times uh, I, if I were to tell you about the lowest times of my life, I, I'll know that I made it through them because God was there with me and made my life better. I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a whole world out there whose life, people who want to know how their life can be better, and we've got what it takes for that to happen. We don't ourselves have it, but, but we've received it from Jesus Christ. We've received this good news that we're to witness to to the ends of the ends of the world. We have 
in Jesus Christ what it takes to grow his kingdom and to share. Um, I know we've got to, we're going to uh, move along in our service and I'll give you a challenge in just a little bit, but I'll go ahead and challenge you even now. Let me go ahead and make that challenge now and then we can pray about it when it's time to come forward. My challenge to you and to me today is to speak to someone and to witness to someone. Witnessing doesn't have to follow four spiritual laws or be all anything like that. Just think of how God's made your life better and share that with someone and listen to someone this week. That's my challenge. That's our challenge today.